We've been in Leviticus. I didn't look up the exact date. <clears throat> but I do know this, that we got down through uh, the last part of Leviticus chapter 3. And then in Leviticus chapter 3, it talks about the sweet savor offerings, uh, the peace offerings, uh, because Christ is our peace. And uh, chapter 4, it starts talking about the sin offerings. And so uh, we'll read uh, first uh, six verses and then see uh, what comments we might have on, on that. And I got uh, some J. Vernon McGee stuff, and you know, you know, he's always uh, got some stuff to say. We'll read just a little bit of that. He's got four points here. We may read two of them uh, about these offerings. Uh, verse 1, Leviticus chapter 4, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done and shall do against any of them, if the priest that is appointed do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin, which he hath sinned, a young bullock without blemish, and to the Lord for a sin offering. And he shall bring the bullock into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before the Lord. And the priest uh, that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord before the veil of the sanctuary. Uh, Schofield's got some notes there. It says, The sin offering, though still Christ, just like the sweet savor offerings of uh, chapter 3, is Christ seen laden with the believer's sin, absolutely in the sinner's place and stead, and not, as in the sweet savor offerings, in his own perfections. It is Christ's death as viewed in several different places in the Bible, and uh, the sin offerings are <coughs> substitutional and have in view the vindication of the law through substitutional sacrifice. And uh, J. Vernon McGee said is, this is the longest account here in uh, chapter 4 because it goes all the way through chapter 5 and verse 13. It uh, is the longest and actually, it's a little bit longer than what he says because uh, it goes through chapter 5, 13. Chapter 4 has got 35 verses. And he says it's the longest account of any offering since it's twice as long as any of the other four. The burnt offering that's earlier in Leviticus was 17 verses. The meal offering, 16. Peace offering, 17. Trespass offering, 19. And here in chapter 4, the sin offering is 35 plus the 13 of chapter 5, so that makes about 48 just off the top of my head. And uh, he says the sin offering was an entirely new offering. Up to this time, there is no record anywhere of the sin offering. There's no previous record of it occurring in Scripture, and, uh, cert and no heathen nation had anything that was even similar to it. So if we look at these uh, first two verses, word came to Moses saying, speaking to the children of Israel, and this is a sin of ignorance. Not uh, something, somebody going out deliberately doing something, but uh, we'll get to that here in just a minute. Somebody going out deliberately sinning. Speaking to the children of Israel, saying, if a soul shall sin through ignorance, in, uh, if you live on the other side of the road, ignorance, uh, against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done and should do against any of them. So he's, he starts out with the priest and he's going on through. But uh, what about them that don't do it through ignorance? Just go out and, hey, this is what I'm going to do. 
Well, let's turn over to the New Testament. Writer of Hebrews, which I believe is Paul, writes a little bit about that. If you'll turn over with me to Hebrews 10, starting in verse 26. You know, we talked about verse 25 uh, Sunday, and a lot of times uh, before Sunday, and probably a lot of times after Sunday. Because uh, Hebrews 10, 25 is uh, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Because uh, we need to be together. Uh, yesterday, <coughs> <coughs> I was mowing grass and uh, got done, and Sandy, Amy reminded me of something. You didn't put your mask on. So, cough had got quite a bit better. And anyway, as you can see tonight, it's going a little bit back the other way. But uh, in, the, in the spot that I burned all that stuff last year, I've got one remnant of it left. And I think when I burn these stumps, I'm, that remnant's going to go over there and, and, uh, going to be burned with them stumps. But uh, telling you all that to say this, remind you that when those logs were separate, was there a little bit of heat there? Kind of a smolder. But when those logs, when I pushed those logs together, the flame came back, visible. And again, it would get so hot getting close to that fire that uh, couldn't stand it for very long. And you say, why are you telling us all that? Well, as individual believers, we need to be together with other believers. Outside, out yonder by ourselves, are we still a believer? Amen. But we're smoldering. We ain't on fire. But when we can come together and encourage one another, the fire from the Holy Spirit is rekindled. Revived, I guess is a good word for that. But anyway, verse 26 through verse 28, Hebrews chapter 10. Leviticus, if you sin through ignorance, Hebrews 10, 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. But, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Now, a uh, guy that Wesley, Ronnie, and I went to high school with. Uh, we went together for church together for a while, First Baptist Anderson. And uh, he and I would get together and talk about our pastor. And uh, here's how the conversation went. I said, what, what do you think about it? I said, uh, this is how I described it. I said, if he'd have went to high school with us, he'd have been one we hung out with. Because... Things he talked about were things we talked about when we were coming up. And uh, kind, of, kind of the way he was raised was kind of the way that uh, we was raised. And uh, he and I agreed that, hey, we'd have hung out with this guy. Uh, because when we first went to church, First Baptist Anderson, uh, their oldest was about... Uh, wasn't exactly the same age as Anna, but close. Uh, I think they went to the same preschool, and uh, we just all hit it off. Uh, he and I would stay for choir practice, and where would I find my wife and children? Well, they'd be off the pastor's house, which was right next door to the church, uh, a little bit closer than the, the parsonage here. So... I remember the first night, one of the first nights we went over there, their little boy climbed up in my lap and went to sleep. And they was like, where have you been? What do you mean? 
But he said, well, for the first three months of his life, all he did was scream. And basically, we had to beg people here at church to keep him. And said, didn't you come along? He climbs up in your lap and goes to sleep. Where, where, where have you been? So we hit it off. And the little fella grew up. Now, while they were still there, he developed a awful habit of playing in the toilet water. I mean, whip him, tell him not to, whip him, whip him, tell him not to, stay out of the toilet water. Guess where they find him? Well, he's back in the toilet water again. And they tell me about one time that they went into the bathroom and he is looking with the lid up. What was he looking for? He was looking for that whooping to come because he knew he wasn't supposed to be in the toilet water. But yet they found, when they found him, he was laying back looking with the lid up. What was he fixing to do? He's fixing playing that toilet water again. So, if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain feel, fearful looking for of judgment. He knew what was coming. They had delivered it before, and they knew, he knew, He's fixing to get it again. But there he was. And fixing to get into process of doing it again. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fairy, fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Now, verse 28. Because in Leviticus it says, if you sin out of ignorance, this is what you need to do. What if you did it willfully? Verse 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Ouch. I had a young man in the youth group at Anderson. He was with me for several years. And one of his favorite parts of the Old Testament was the stonings. I don't, I don't know why he was so thrilled, just so excited about the stonings. Well, uh, that verse there, would uh, he would enjoy that verse. Stonings. So those that trespassed God's law back in Moses' day, uh, they wasn't going to be no second attempt, third attempt. You weren't going to be found with the toilet led up looking. Because they died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So since we're here, we might as well get verse 29. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who's taken God's word, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. But that's not what Leviticus is talking about. Then here in Hebrews, this is knowing full well what you're doing. But in Leviticus, it's the ones who don't know, don't realize. Now, uh, y'all have heard me talk about Brother Butler. Here's one of the priors of Brother Butler that I remember. Lord, uh, forgive me for my known sins. Forgive me for my unknown sins. You say, well, what's an unknown sin? Uh, that'd be a sin we didn't know about. Here's what J. Vernon McGee says. The Word of God contains the remedy for man today. 
If you have a problem, you're bothered with a guilt complex, cry out as David did in Psalm 139. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and then lead me in the way everlasting. And he adds in, my friend, our problem is not that our mothers didn't give us all the love we should have had when we were those little brats. Our problem is that we are sinners by nature. So let's get on God's couch and tell him about it. Go to the great physician and talk to him. He said a group of men gathered regularly for prayer. One man had a prayer, kind of like I told you, Brother Butler had. Lord, if we have committed, he'd pray this way. Uh, Lord, if we've committed any sin, forgive us. And the men got tired of hearing it. And one of them spoke up and says, uh, why don't you tell him what the sin is? And the man answered, well, I don't know what it is. The leader said, why, why don't you take a guess at it? And you know, the man's first guess was right. We need to confess our sins to God. Because if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The sin offering teaches us that we must see ourselves as God sees us. It brings before us the consciousness of sin, our own unworthiness. But also in it, we see God's provision. Turn over with me to Psalm 32 and verse number 5. This is a time in, in David's life that uh, sin had crept in to his life, and uh, he kind of like Moeller and Curly, I believe it was. You know, they found a, a zipper in the uh, carpet, if you remember, your Three Stooges. Uh, and they swept, instead of getting a dustpan sweeping up all the dirt, they just unzipped the carpet and swept it in that zippered hole and uh, then zipped it back up. Hey, everything's great now. Dust is gone. Uh, yeah, until somebody comes and walks over again. Guess what? All the dust is still back up there. And that's kind of what David did. David was the king. When I was in uh, getting my master's degree, part one of our assignments was we had to set up a kingdom or set up a country, and we had to choose what kind of uh, leader was going to have. And so we made Johnny Tidwell, some of y'all know who Johnny Tidwell is, we made him king. And you know what we allowed Johnny Tidwell to do? Whatever Johnny Tidwell wanted to. Why? He was the king. Don't kings usually do whatever they want to? So, hey, whatever Johnny wanted, Johnny was going to get. Why? Because he was the king. So we set up a monarchy and uh, did that. This is what David did. The Bible says it was at a time when the kings go out to battle. Guess what? David didn't go. Why? Did anybody say anything about it? Probably not. He's the king. If anybody said anything against the king, probably what was the fixing to happen? Well, uh, who was it? King Henry VIII? That's some of his wives. So what? Uh, I don't think, did he ever divorce any wife? I don't think he had to. He did? I thought they all met the guillotine. He divorced one. Uh, but several of them met up with the guillotine. And uh, so David's supposed to be out at battle because that's when the kings go. I'm staying at the house. And that's when he... Uh, some people say, had an affair. Well, let's just call it what it was. 
him and Bathsheba committed adultery. And, uh, hey, he's living with it, has her husband killed, takes her as a wife. Hey, everything's wonderful, ain't it? No. David was a man most miserable because there was unconfessed sin in his life. Uh, Psalm 32, I know there's a several chapters in between that and chapter 51, Psalm 51, but them two chapters go together. It was a time in David's life when he needed a freshness from God. And as we read Psalm 51 where it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit in me. That was the time David was. But uh, let's look at chapter 32. Start reading in verse 1. We'll get down to verse 5 here just a little bit. It says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now, that ain't talking about we've swept it under the rug. Now, we've confessed it to God. And in God, we find forgiveness. So blessed, happy, to be envied is he whose transgression, whose sin is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed, uh, happy, to be envied is a man and to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, in whose spirit there is no guile. Now, verse 3, he starts talking about the time in his life when he just kept those things to himself. He didn't confess them to God. And who came and asked him about it? For a while, nobody. Why didn't anybody ask the king, King, you, you look sad today. What's wrong? Because he's the king, nobody came. One of my teachers at Lexington one day asked me, uh, Marty, what's wrong? Nothing. Well, you, you know, you, you know good and well I wasn't smiling, but I reckon my frown on that day was a little bit something extra because he wanted to know. And what he said next, I appreciate so much because, you know, as believers... We need to build one another up. He said, well, whatever it is, I just want you to know this. Marty, I love you. And Miss Karen, I think I walked away from him just a little bit with a kind of maybe. Uh, i got to work on that where I can frown on one side and smile on the other. I ain't got that yet. I can wiggle both ears, but hadn't hadn't got where I can smile and frown at the same time. Uh, that's the way David was. And, and nobody came up to him. David, what, King David, what's wrong? How can I help you? Because he's the king, nobody wants to ask. Verse 3, When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all day long. You know, Miss Karen, he might have been, I don't know how tall he was. Six four on a good day. David? Nobody asked. David, what's wrong? Nobody wants to ask question the king. But he's saying here, I, I was miserable. I waxed old all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. And then we get down to verse 5, which leads us over to chapter 51. Oh, the Lord, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in me. Because verse 5, he says, I acknowledge my sin unto thee. And mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. So, here in Leviticus chapter 4, as we've started digging into that tonight, we find this sin offering. And the first ones I start out with is the priest. And some of us might be sitting there thinking, Whew, man, glad I ain't, don't stop now. The Bible teaches the priesthood of believers. I want you to know this. 
how the priest went, so did the congregation. Priest didn't confess. Well, then uh, everything the priest was doing must be fine. Let's fall in line behind him. But he gives the method of which the priest was supposed to do it. And uh, verse 3, if the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring. Now, was the priest supposed to come to Marty's pastor and get Marty's best? Was he supposed to go to anybody else's? No, he was supposed to bring the best of his. Each individual was supposed to bring the best that he's got. If the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin, which he hath sinned, a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. God looked down upon us. He saw the sin. He needed the perfect sacrifice. And he gave his son, his perfect son. He gave himself as that sacrifice. Perfect, without blemish, without sin. And he died for you, he died for me. So he starts out with the priest. Next week we'll continue digging in just a little bit more, but... Uh, brought the best not not the lame one not the one was going to call maybe take the cell bar next week now the best the one that maybe won the blue ribbon at the fire if they had a fire carnival that one you maybe had him up Fattening him up. Hey, he's the best. That one. Sacrifice to God as a sin offering. Uh, did you make anything tonight before we close? Thank y'all so much for being here. And uh, let's bow our heads for a word of, prayer, word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your many blessings that uh, you send our way. Thank you for Jesus, who the perfect sacrifice, who went to the cross for us, that through him we can have eternal life. And Lord, uh, as we go out through, <coughs> through the rest of this week, Lord, uh, I ask you to bless us. Lord, uh, be with these. Uh, the storm seemed like it's done past us tonight, but Lord, uh, be with those that's in the path of these storms tonight. And be with these that's mentioned for prayer. And uh, return us again Sunday to worship you again. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.